This is about Sorcerer's Apprentice, which was the second travel book that I wrote uh, after Beyond the Devil's Teeth. I'm quite outspoken about the way travel writers go about their work, and um, I've always been inspired really by the great Victorian travellers, people like uh, Richard Burton, Heinrich Barth, the German, who searched for Timbuktu, uh, um, and a slew of others, including Stanley, and Mungo Park, Livingston, and all kinds of others. And the last thing that they ever thought of was to go out and get a commission. What they did was to uh, go on a huge expedition, see if they came back alive, and then write it up and publish it and hopefully make some cash. And they used that cash to uh, either retire or go on another expedition. And it was a system that worked really, really well. But scratch forward a whole load of years, and what happened in the second half of the last century was the travelers would go to a publisher, get a big, fat, juicy commission on the idea that their book written on the subject of their next adventure would sell, and then they would go off with the cash that they had been given, um, usually in a brown paper bag, and they'd go on this huge adventure. And it's something which um, has really changed travel, and something which I, well, <laughs> I'm a complete hypocrite because sometimes I've been paid yummy amounts of money to go on fabulous trips. I'm really, really down on the subject. And uh, the one man who inspired me more than anyone else, uh, Wilfred Thesiger, or Sir Wilfred Thesiger, as he was later known, um, the great Arab uh, explorer, um, British explorer in Arab lands, he would always tell me that most of the travel books coming out those days when, when we were talking in the 80s and 90s, he said to me that they were stunts. They were nothing more than stunts. And they were cheap ways that people were using to try to sell uh, a story to a publisher and then a book. And I, uh, so I'm telling you all of this because Sorcerer's Apprentice was really a very different kind of book for me anyway, as the author of it. I had never intended to write about the times um, I had spent in India learning about magic. And this whole sort of episode of my life had begun as a kid when Hafiz Jan, this great Pashtun warrior character, turned up at our house in Langton Green in Kent, uh, where my dad, um, Idris Shah, the writer Idris Shah, would always hold court. And because Hafiz Jan was uh, um, the guardian of an ancestral tomb of our family in northern India, at Sadhana, uh, he was brought in. And I was a kid, maybe 11 years old, and over the weeks that he stayed, Hafiz John unpacked a great sea, uh, well, it was actually, I was going to say sea trunk, but it was actually a big tea chest that he travelled with. And in this tea chest were all kinds of incredibly dangerous chemicals which he used to do magic tricks. And over the m weeks and months he stayed, he taught me part of uh, his large repertoire. Years and years and years and years passed, and I thought it would be fantastic fun to learn um, Indian magic, the kind of magic that god men do in India on a daily on a daily basis. So what I did was I went to India and I landed up at uh, Hafiz John's house, and he was delighted to find me, but then horrified at the thought of teaching me real uh, stage magic, as we would call it in the West. And he said, I must go and find his teacher, uh, Hakim Faroz, who was a master magician living in Calcutta. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of the whole thing too much, but I tracked down Hafiz Jan, who, uh, excuse me, I tracked down Hakim Faroz, who was this wild sort of sadistic man. Sadly, he's, he's died um, now. He died in uh, the early 2000s. And after saying he wouldn't take me on as his pupil and that he had retired, he did take me on. And I spent a long time with him at his house in Alipur in Calcutta. Um, firstly, doing incredibly menial chores uh, and um, awful, uh, awful things like, um, like digging a pit with a teaspoon and um, uh, dragging sacks full of ice around his courtyard. 
And he said this would really test whether I was up for learning the kind of magic he would teach. And as time went on, he began to teach me after a very long um, uh, introductory phase. And he began to teach me the kind of stage magic, I said, that, uh, that we, we regard as um, pure illusion in, in the West. But in India, is used every day in villages and towns up and down the country and cities by this breed of very, very special people called godmen um, who capitalize on uh, the Indian um, obsession with the miraculous. And it's something which not for a moment do I, do I make fun of, but I'm in awe of. I think, think it's the default setting of humanity to want to be um, amazed by uh, miracles and magic. And I'm actually very down on the West, where um, people, you know, they, uh, they have it drummed out of them. If you go to a children's birthday party, for example, as I get to do quite often at the moment, um, the kids, if there's a stage magician there, they are delighted. And even though, as they get older, they know that it is stage magic and that it's illusion, they still want to believe, and they do believe. And I think that's... There's a bit of that in all of us, and it's something that godmen in India certainly bring out. So I've never intended to write about this. And actually, when later when my book, Sorcerer's Apprentice, came out, Hakim Feroz, I hadn't sent him a copy because I was too frightened, and he heard about it because an edition came out in India. And he, I thought, what's he going to do? And he was, as I expected, incredibly wildly, um, insanely angry with me. And he said... I was just belittling him and um, we made up, finally we made up, but there were very uncomfortable exchanges um, from, from him to me. I wouldn't dare have um, ever defended myself, although I, I tried to whisper a few words of, um, of, of apology. But the book for me was um, a chance to show the extraordinary, varied and vivid colourful underbelly of India, modern India. Um, the question I get asked endlessly by people who have read it, and I, I just always know when they come up to me and they say, someone did it the other day at a talk I was giving, um, Mr. Shah, there's uh, a question I have about your book, Sorcerer's Apprentice. I know they're going to ask me, is it all true? And the truth is, yes, 99% of it is true. Um, and actually, the truth is, if they want to know, I left out a lot of stuff which was too crazy to put in because I just thought no one's going to believe this. But in, my, in an explanation, what I usually, usually say to people is that what I tried to do was to observe India in an oriental way and not to show the country and the society and the culture in the way that Western people usually um, regard it. I tried to look at it in a different way and I mean look I've got a coffee cup right here that I've grabbed off my desk. Usually people in the West will look at it from face on and um, they always look at something with one uh, point, of, point of view but I think, and there's a bit of coffee in here so I can't do it too much, it's much more interesting to look at something from all kinds of angles, you know, and really observe it in a new way. And as a great friend of mine, uh, Robert Twigger, said to me when I was sitting down to write a book recently, he said, I said, I can't write this book, I don't know what I'm going to say. He said, take what you know and turn it very slowly into the light and observe it. And by doing that, he reminded me of what I had done in Sorcerer's Apprentice. And it was a system that had worked so well, but, and one that caught a lot of people's attention, but at the same time, one that has baffled people ever since.